Former police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all counts, including murder in the second degree and the third degree, second degree manslaughter. There was speculation that due to the riots, the jurors would be scared and would just say guilty to avoid any retribution or to avoid ongoing riots. Yesterday, in an interview with CBS, we heard from one of the jurors who turned out to be an alternate who did not actually weigh in on the verdict, though she was sitting there for the entire trial and she didn't know she was an alternate. She stated that she felt Derek Chauvin was guilty because the prosecution made a compelling case. Interestingly, there are some arguments that what she said could be grounds for an appeal. Also, you had Maxine Waters, a Democrat who came to the city and said, if they don't give us what we want, we're going to do more, get more confrontational. Again, grounds for appeal. It turns out there are many grounds for appeal, and it seems that Chauvin may actually be granted this. Some people think it's likely he will actually get out on appeal and maybe only spend a couple of years behind bars. Following this interview with the alternate juror, we received another interview with this juror. This time, in no uncertain terms, she said she was scared about retaliation. She was scared about people coming to her home, and she was scared of the riots and wanted them to stop. In the first interview, she just said she, was, she felt everybody would be angry. That's not really saying you're worried about rioters coming to your home. But during jury selection, we heard that some people expressed this fear. And it seems obvious to anybody that there was no way Derek Chauvin would have a fair trial. Right now, many activists are cheering, saying the riots worked. It got them what they wanted. Following the verdict, they are now saying it's not justice. They will not stop rioting and they want more. They're not going to clear the autonomous zone in Minneapolis. They were rioting just the other day in Manhattan. And we are seeing just how truly, just how, how, how truly depraved many of these people are and how ignorant the jurors were. The politicians are, and many regular people are, when they keep thinking they will give these extremists what they want and it will make it stop. They begged, please make it stop. Donald Trump said he would. Donald Trump said he would send in federal law enforcement or deputize state police with federal law enforcement powers so that these people who get arrested could actually be convicted. It actually started working. But then Joe Biden said it was Trump's America. And if you voted for him, people would stop. Prominent figures like Sam Harris says, hey, if, if you vote for Biden, it'll be easier for me to explain why these people are bad. It's only getting worse. Chauvin's found guilty. And they're saying, no, it's not justice because they need a cause to rally. They need a cause to use to gain power. Under Joe Biden, the riots, the riots are actually just getting worse. And now these people are saying they won't rest because there's more officers who have to stand trial. So did Derek Chauvin get convicted on false pretenses in an unfair trial. Will this lead to an appeal and will it lead to more riding? In my opinion, yeah, absolutely. I want to show you what's being said. I want to show you some of the ramifications of what's happening. And I want to show you how the media is lying and manipulating. But this story, my friends, is shocking. I covered the initial interview yesterday when the woman said she was scared she'd you know, make everybody angry. And I said, well, that's not a direct admission that the riots played a role in this, but I think it's as close as we'll get. She came out and said it. Let me read for you this quote from this interview about what this juror actually said. I think you can expect the riots to get substantially worse because I will repeat, they rioted last night. They're refusing to shut down the autonomous zone in Minneapolis. They want power and they will stop at nothing to get it. They have you scared thinking that if you give them an inch, they will finally stop, but they never will. It will only get worse. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com and become a member by clicking the members only button on the top right, and you will get exclusive at, you'll get access to exclusive members only segments, which you'll find in the members area. We had a great conversation about woke media with Seamus of Freedom Tunes, but I really do recommend the segment we did with Charlie LaDuff. He's a journalist, and he told us about some really awful things from crooked and corrupt reporters during 9-11. And we have a big conversation about it, a long conversation about this. Go to TimCast.com because you'll be supporting the work that I do and helping us grow the business. I greatly appreciate it. But don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Let me read for you what may be one of the most shocking developments in the aftermath of the Derek Chauvin trial. From Care 11 NBC, quote, I wish it didn't have to happen. Alternate juror reflects on Derek Chauvin trial. 
a juror who didn't know she was an alternate in Chauvin's trial details why she supports the former Minneapolis officer being convicted in George Floyd's murder. Now, most of you probably know the deliberations took just over 10 hours. It was extremely fast, which meant to a lot of people, either they walked in and were like, we're guilty, right? Or not guilty. It was one or the other. It wasn't going to be a hung jury. A hung jury is when there's no unanimous decision and they say, we, we can't, we can't figure it out. It's got to be unanimous. But I would be surprised if it was not guilty because the risk to these individuals was too great. Media had already been trying to reveal as much information about the jurors as possible. One woman even tried taking a photograph in court. The jurors were not sequestered. The judge failed. We are going and and we're going to see an appeal. That is, I I think, a 100 percent certainty. I think he's going to win. Here's the story. A woman who sat as an alternate on the jury that found Derek Chauvin guilty in George Floyd's murder is speaking out about what it, what it was like to parse through nearly three weeks of testimony in the former Minneapolis officer's high profile trial. Brooklyn Center resident Lisa Christensen told CARES 11 Lou Reguse about her role on the jury as another police killing unfolded in her neighborhood. Brooklyn Center is where the Dante Wright riots are occurring. Dante Wright was shot and killed in, as, as he was resisting officers. It's a tragic event. But they rioted in Brooklyn Center where this juror lived. And even the defense brought this up. Doesn't seem to matter to the judge. The judge refused to grant a new venue. The judge refused to sequester the jury. Christensen, who lives in a city where a white officer shot and killed a 20-year-old black man this month <laughs> during the trial, said that if she had been part of deliberations, she would have found Chauvin guilty. But Christensen had no idea that she was one of two alternates until the judge dismissed her right before the 12 jurors were sequestered. So she was treating this as though she was going to be in deliberations. Reguse asks, did you know that you were going to be an alternate? No, I did not. Were you disappointed when you found out that you were an alternate? She said, I was. I spent three weeks of my time getting invested and going through all kinds of emotions. My heart broke a little when he turned and said, number 96, you're an alternate. When you made it on the jury, how much did you know about the case and what were your thoughts? She said, I saw the video, but not in its entirety. I saw it two or three times in the news. I do not use social media, so I did not post anything or see anything there. The journalist says, you are the perfect juror in that aspect. You came in with about as clean a slate as somebody can have, considering how big a big of a case this was. She said, yeah. I did tell them I saw the settlement run across the bottom of the screen one day. What did that settlement mean to you? The juror says, I knew it was a separate case. I knew civil cases are different with different rules, so it did not affect me. I was not surprised there was a settlement, but I was surprised they announced it beforehand. Let me just pause real quick before we even get to the more stunning admission. The city settled with the family of George Floyd for a historical $27 million. How that wouldn't affect someone is mind boggling to me. The city admitted fault by doing so. Maybe not literally in a legal sense, but in the court of public opinion, absolutely. Raguse says, did you want to be a juror? Here we go. The juror says, I had mixed feelings. There was a question on the questionnaire about it, and I put, I did not know. The reason at that time was I did not know what the outcome was going to be. So I felt like either Either way, you are going to disappoint one group or another. I did not want to go through rioting and destruction again. And I was concerned about people coming to my house if they were not happy with the verdict. I'm going to read, read you that one more time. She said, I did not know what the outcome was going to be. I felt like either way you are going to disappoint one group or the other. I did not want to go through rioting and destruction again. And I was concerned about people coming to my house if they were not happy with the verdict. I'm sorry. That's an admission. We all know that there's no group of Trump supporters rampaging through this country for the past year. Sure, we had January 6th, shocked many people, but it was not the worst possible thing that we had seen. I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't an ongoing campaign of chaos and destruction throughout many cities. The media will tell you, Many leftists and liberals will tell you the cities are fine. The right is hyper focused on these isolated incidents. It's a lie. Journalist Michael Tracy traveled to many small towns and found that they had been terrorized, that there there had been riots in even small cities you've never heard of. It was kind of a shocking and it was a shocking story, but an excellent piece of legitimate on the ground reporting. 
and uh, tremendous respect for Michael Tracy for doing it. One of the last few remaining honest journalists at the national level. They're great local reporters, don't get me wrong, but he actually got in his car and he drove to these towns. He took photos and you can see in small towns you've never heard of on the windows, please don't hurt us. We support Black Lives Matter. You mean to tell me this woman was scared that a Trump supporter was going to show up to her house? Absolutely not. The first statement she made yesterday was just, I was worried I would make people angry. Okay, it's close to admitting that you're worried about Black Lives Matter riots. But she then says, I did not want to go through rioting and destruction. The Trump supporters didn't riot and burn down buildings and smash windows. Sorry, it didn't happen. The Blue Lives Matter people didn't go around smashing windows. It did not happen. We know who she's referring to. That's shocking. Reduce, the journalist asks, what were your thoughts on the fact that the trial was televised? She said it made it more tense, at least. I thought that in the beginning, I'm, I thought that in the beginning, I'm glad it was because it made it transparent so everyone knows and cannot question what happened. He says you were an alternate, but you would have, but would, would you have voted guilty or not guilty? She said, I would have voted guilty, however. At the end, the judge did read us the rules for deliberation, but it was quick and I could not absorb it. I would have said guilty on some level after I was excused. I did not look at the jury instructions any longer. I did not know how hard that process was, but I feel like Chauvin is responsible for Mr. Floyd's death. Why? I think the prosecution did a good presentation of their case. Dr. Tobin was the one I really related to. I feel like all the doctors in one way or another said the same thing. She was asked, do you think the use of force was reasonable? She said, I do not. Do you think that Derek Chauvin caused George Floyd's death? She says, I feel like the kneeling on the neck for so long did. You heard a lot of testimony about the use of force. Was the force reasonable? And did the knee cause Floyd's death? Did it seem like those were the major questions that were presented to you? The juror says, yes. We heard a lot about the use of force. Was it excessive? Was it necessary? When do police officers stop it? And could it have been stopped at one point? I kept thinking about the critical decision making model that that was presented. It was in the back of my mind about how they said you must reassess constantly. And, it, and, and I felt like that was not done. He says, which witness convinced you that it was not that it was was an unreasonable use of force? I thought LAPD Sergeant Jody Steiger, the prosecution expert, did a good job of explaining to us. She says, some of the trainers said, I don't even know what that is. We don't train like that. That was helpful to hear because they said they can use force, but it did not seem like they could use that type of force. So it does seem like she was swayed by the prosecution. And it may be that there's a legitimate verdict here. It's the felony murder rule. Chauvin was not trained to do this. Many of the prosecution witnesses that said they didn't do it. The question for me was always reasonable doubt. Because it's not so much about what you're trained to do. It's about what's reasonable for a police officer. I think a police officer moving the, the knee between the neck and the back, as it was testified by several experts, including the prosecution's own witness, wasn't the worst possible thing that could have been done to George Floyd, considering he was resisting arrest. I don't like the system. I, I'm not a fan of a lack of police accountability. But when you have someone resisting arrest and you have the option to tase them and you choose to simply put them on the ground instead, I, I don't know what the cops are supposed to do, especially when crowds are forming. I wish it didn't happen. But I don't think it's an issue of murder. I don't think that Chauvin was assaulting George Floyd by trying to restrain him. These are complicated questions. The, the real issue at hand is that she outright said she was scared of the riots. So let me bring you to the next big question. The appeals process from ABA Journal. After Chauvin's conviction on all counts, what will his appeal look like? I'm going to read you the grounds for appeal, and you're probably going to say, wow. It goes through some of what the juror actually stated. ABA says, an appeal is a virtual certainty following the conviction Tuesday of fired officer Derek Chauvin in the killing of George Floyd. Chauvin was convicted of all three charges against him, second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. ABA president Patricia Lee Refo issued a statement after the verdict saying, the association respects the decision of the Minneapolis jury in the trial of Derek Chauvin while emphasizing that a single verdict is neither an indictment of all law enforcement nor a solution to the systemic inequities in our justice system. On Wednesday, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced an investigation of the Minneapolis Police Department to assess whether it has a pattern of, or practice of using excessive force. Chauvin's sentencing will be in eight weeks, according to Judge Peter Cahill of Hennepin County. Chauvin's sentences on the three charges are likely to run concurrently, Vox reports. The maximum for the most serious charge 
is 40 years in prison. But judges in Minnesota typically rely on sentencing guidelines, which make the base sentence 12.5 years because Chauvin has no criminal history. Next comes consideration of aggravating factors, which will be determined by the judge because Chauvin waived his right for a jury to make the call. Prosecutors claim that Chauvin acted with particular cruelty and abused his position of authority, aggravating factors that allow Cahill to increase the sentence. USA Today, Vox, Reuters, Bloomberg, and Politico have stories on issues that Chauvin may raise on appeal. They include, first, failure to sequester jurors or move the trial because of publicity. Lead defense lawyer Eric Nelson had no success when he sought to delay the trial of an announcement two weeks before the start date that the city of Minneapolis had agreed to pay $27 million to settle a lawsuit over Floyd's death. He also was unsuccessful in obtaining a mistrial because of a comment by Democratic U.S. Rep. Maxine Waters of California that protesters should get more confrontational if Chauvin is acquitted. On this point, a juror actually said I was scared of the riots. I think her admission of that is particularly bad for the current trial and the verdict. It means that Chauvin's attorneys are going to be able to say not only did they pay a settlement, which is uh, too many an admission of guilt. Not only did, 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 was there another shooting and more riots, and Maxine Waters said get, have more riots, the juror admitted she was scared of the riots. Sorry, that was grounds for a mistrial in my opinion, and now it's going to end up being an appeal. Next, misconduct by a prosecutor in closing argument. Nelson argued that a state prosecutor's rebuttal crossed the line when he said Nelson's defense was creating stories and shading the truth to confuse jurors. His bid to get a mistrial on the issue failed. Minnesota has a rule that bars prosecutors from belittling the defense, which they literally did. And the judge even admitted initially the prosecution in their rebuttal said that the defense was creating stories. There was an objection. The judge said overruled because saying it's a story is not belittling. But watch it, prosecution. They then went on to say that they were shading the truth and fabricating facts and things of that nature. And the judge then sustained the objection, saying, come on now, you can't do that. But he did. Grounds for an appeal. Next, ineffective assistance of counsel. Nelson did not object to emotional witness testimony, including testimony by the teenager who took the video of Floyd's death. Darnella Fraser said she has stayed up some nights apologizing and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. Now, this one's interesting. The juror who spoke up actually said that was was extremely compelling testimony. The emotional appeal of someone watching, which has no bearing on the reasonable actions of an officer. Nelson did not object. That was ineffective. It could be argued. Next, the incorrect third degree murder charge. The law punishes those who cause death without intent by perpetrating an act imminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. Judge Cahill at first ruled the law applies only when multiple people are put in danger and not when a dangerous act is directed at just one person, as in the case of Floyd. But Cahill reversed himself based on a subsequent appellate decision in the case of another former Minneapolis police officer. Next, cause of death testimony. Prosecutors sought to introduce new evidence on the cause of Floyd's death and asked a pathologist legal questions that jurors will have to answer, some defense experts said. And lastly, testimony by Minneapolis Police Chief Madaria Arredondo. His testimony was expected to focus on the department's training and policies, but he twice said Chauvin's conduct violated department ethics and values. What you need to understand is that the prosecution is supposed to give a heads up. Well, well, both sides are basically supposed to admit into evidence certain things. And the judge can say yes or no. They make arguments for why they should be allowed. But the defense needs to know what the state is arguing so that they can defend. The burden of proof is on the state. The, The accused need only reasonable doubt. I think when you see what this juror stated, you see the grounds for appeal. There should have been a mistrial in this case. They should never have allowed this trial to take place in, 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 in the Minneapolis area. But they did. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you why this is so uh, bad for justice in this country. If there's a verdict against Derek Chauvin because he went above and beyond what he was allowed to do, then he deserves to be found guilty, period. I mean, anyone does. I don't care if you're Donald Trump or Joe Biden. If you're guilty, you're guilty. If you're, if you're not guilty, you're not guilty. However, we can clearly see the effect that the riots had 
And now we have a juror saying as much, which means this is not a fair trial. And the activists are now going on Twitter saying the riots worked and they'll keep doing it. Interestingly, there's this weird thing. You know, I've consistently said violence does not work. We need to move to a new era of communications. And I've pointed out that those who oppose far left extremism fighting an uphill battle, the media, of course, supports them. For you, it's about persuasion. It's about playing the game properly. However, the left is now gloating on Twitter, posting memes where you have people on the right saying violence doesn't solve anything. And then also saying that Derek Chauvin got convicted because the left burnt cities to the ground, figuratively, somewhat literally. Whenever you say they burn cities down, you get these news reports were like false. They didn't burn down an entire city. What I mean to say is they burned down several buildings in many of these cities. They destroyed windows. They attacked people. More than two dozen died. And it worked for them. And that's terrifying. And you know what the result has been? From Post Millennial, a tweet from me and Miles Chong. There's a video where a Black Lives Matter activist says, we are never going to be satisfied. How about this from IndieWire? Kerry Washington, Will Packer, and more react to George Floyd verdict. Accountability, not justice. Packer wrote that watching the trial, the verdict was exhausting. But for a brief moment right now, we can exhale onward. It's not justice. It's not enough. From Market Watch, we have a similar story highlighting similar quotes. It's accountability, but not justice. AOC, Pelosi, Zuckerberg, and other leaders react to Chauvin verdict. It will never be enough. This one from the Intelligencer. This is not justice. It's self-preservation. Amazing. This is where we are at, my friends. They have convicted a man on all counts. Murder. Because he was told to arrest somebody. Now, I don't like that George Floyd lost his life. I can say it 50 million times. It's a sad story. There's a video of George Floyd telling young people to get away from crime and violence and not do these things. And people, I see conservatives say, George Floyd was a violent criminal and all this stuff. He had a past. Absolutely true. But in recent history, he was putting out a plea to young people to not make the same mistakes he did. And that made me sad. The dude was addicted. I'm sad that he lost his life. He had medical conditions. I'm sad at everything that happened. But we have to understand that not everything is evil. Not every tragedy is an act of malice. Derek Chauvin may have been callous, which is why you could argue a manslaughter charge, in my opinion. He's given a priority one call, turn on the lights, rush to the scene. There's a man, six foot one, 220 pounds, resisting arrest. Local bystanders on body camera footage saying, stop, you can't win, just get in the car. Floyd refused. He kicked his way out and said, hold me on the ground, hold me on the ground, hold me on the ground. They put him on the ground. And maybe Chauvin shouldn't have done it. But the problem is when you ask an officer to respond to someone who's aggressive, there's potentially excited delirium, whatever you want to call it. He's resisting arrest and they don't want it to turn into active aggression. How can you put someone in prison for murder if that's the case? But you get it. You've heard me say 50 million times. The next issue we see is that instead of calling it justice, instead of saying they've gotten what they wanted, instead of saying we've won, thank you all, have a nice day, they're saying, nah, now you're just trying to preserve yourself. It's not justice. We want more. Are you, are you for real? What's next? Abolishing the police. If you followed my segment yesterday, you'd have seen my video about Police resigning in mass. And it's not the first time. I actually kind of, I find this kind of funny. I titled the, the thumbnail, Police Begin Resigning in Mass over, you know, BLM riots. And I'm like, I actually have another video that says basically the same thing from last year. Because they've been. And there's a police shortage across the country right now in many different departments. And it's going to keep happening. I'm not sure I care all that much at this point. I, I got to be honest. I'm not, I, I don't. You know, when the left says we want to abolish the police and I live in a city and I say, no, that's insane. Well, I live in that city. I'm affected by that. When eventually I realized the riots are going to keep happening. The rioters are protected by the establishment, by the media and by the government. Well, then maybe I shouldn't be in an area susceptible to riots because I won't be able to protect myself. And that's when I realized watching the police arrest conservatives and those who would defend them watching the police belittle and mock the conservatives who marched on their behalf, you need to realize the police don't care about you as a whole. Now, a lot of cops do. It's probably why they resigned. 
You got to understand that cops don't approach you like you're some innocent victim they must help. They approach you from a neutral standpoint of, I don't know you. That's why I respect if a cop walks up and he's like freaking out, he's got his gun drawn. He says, put your hands up, get on the ground. I'm going to do it. Just put your hands behind your back. I do it. I keep my mouth shut. And then I just wait. And then given an opportunity, everything calms down. They feel the threat is averted. You speak calmly. I've done this before. I was arrested twice in the past couple of years, or I should say, no, it's been some years in D.C. about four years ago and a year or a few months before that in, uh, during a, a protest in St. Louis. In, in, in the St. Louis instance, I was handcuffed and I was told, you know, stand by, you know, turn around, put your hands behind your back. I said, I'm press. And they said, doesn't matter. I said, OK. They sat me down. And then as the cops were arresting people, I said, pardon me, sir. Pardon me. And the moment I got someone's attention, I just said, I hate to trouble you. Their cuffs are a little tight. They're cutting off my circulation. And he said, hold on. Eventually, supervisor came back and he said, stand up. He loosened the cuffs for me. And then I said, uh, officer, I am a journalist. I do have press credentials. And they said, it doesn't matter. I said, OK. Eventually, as I just sat down and shut up and I was with some other reporters, he walked over and said, you're a journalist. I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you have your ID? Yes, sir. And he says, where is it? I was like, it's my back pocket. He says, we're going to take your wallet out and check your ID. I said, absolutely. Thank you. He did. He released the cuffs and says, sorry about that. Have a good day. I see these videos where people are screaming. There's one video that was posted by Ford Fisher I tweeted about where an ATF agent, so he, was, he, was, he was serving a, a, some kind of, well, I don't know if he had a warrant, but he's at a house and he's walking away. And then a bunch of cops come up with their guns drawn and they say, put your hands up. And he goes, I got my ID. And they say, shut up, put your hands up, get on the ground. And he resists. And I'm like, in, in what world are you going to be an ATF agent and resists cops and scream? Now, I'll tell you why I bring this up. It was funny to watch. This ATF agent refused to put his hand behind his back. When they tried putting him in the car, he refused to get in saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It was very similar to what happened with George Floyd. And I find it funny. I find it funny, man. I'm not a fan of unaccountable police. I'm not a fan of violent agents of the states suppressing people's rights and oppressing them. The problem is these people don't want justice. They want power. So the first thing I say is maybe it's time that police do leave. You've probably heard me say it ad nauseum over the past week. Many cops have. It's not just self-preservation, perhaps, because many of the good cops are leaving. So we'll leave you with bad cops. And it will leave you now with ideological cops. This is going to be in those cities. I don't know what the solution is. I really don't. I can tell you that if you're a juror, if you're in the media, if you're a politician, and you think capitulating to the whims of the extremists who would be given an inch and take 10 miles, then you don't deserve the freedoms that you have. If you would give up even a little bit of your freedom, in exchange for security, you're going to keep losing your freedom. It's not going to stop there. You've got to be actively resisting the measures of the authoritarians to seize your freedoms. But with great power comes great responsibility. With great freedom comes great responsibility. I think about these stories, of the cops quitting, and I respect the cops for doing so. And then I think I'll defend myself. I'll keep the, you know, we have the right to keep and bear arms. Maybe it doesn't make sense to live in a city when they're falling apart. Even Tucker Carlson, I think, has been saying something similar. There was an interview recently where Tucker mentioned that if you, you know, to do it all over, he would rather just, you know, buy a hardware store and get away from the establishment because it doesn't like, you know, these, it doesn't like regular Americans. The system is collapsing. He's right. That's why I got out of the cities, because I could see around me an unwillingness from locals to defend the institutions that they need to protect them and a support from the callous and feckless politicians for extremists who would just demand more. They always will. You have the story from the nation. They say, while a jury found Derek Chauvin guilty of murder earlier this week, that verdict alone, though so desperately needed, was woefully inefficient. Inefficient? I'm sorry, insufficient. You wanted more? That's right. Maxine Waters said first degree murder. I didn't even charge him with that. These rookie cops are going to go to prison. Many of them will probably get killed. The system is falling apart. And for a variety of reasons, you know, seeing interest, you know, interestingly, seeing Stephen Colbert lie 
And he says the Republicans are becoming increasingly more illiberal and fascistic. And I'm like, it's just so funny for him to just speak word garbage. That means nothing. The Republicans don't do anything. They're they're like, I got to be completely honest. You want to talk about a milk toast fence sitter? I love how the joke, you know, about Tim Pool, the moderate, the centrist, milk toast fence sitter. It's funny because I'm not staunch Republican or staunch Democrat. I'm not a conservative. I actually lean a little left, but I don't agree with the establishment left on most things. And I'm not a socialist. So they say you're a milk toast fence sitter. Why? Well, because I'm in the middle. But that's the joke. I embrace it because I find it funny. The reality is I'm absolutely not a, a milk toast fence sitter. No, I take very strong positions on liberty and I get very angry about things. And you'll hear me yelling quite a bit. And people are like, you need to calm down, Tim. The milk toast thing's a joke. You know who is? Mitch McConnell. He's a milk toast fence sitter. He didn't do anything. He goes, blah, blah, blah. Kevin McCarthy, what did he do? We must censure Maxine Waters. You want to know who's not a milk toast fence sitter? Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was like, we must expel Maxine Waters. The Republican Party doesn't do anything. But when you see the establishment media act like the fascists are the Republicans and the Republicans sit on their hands and the Democrats are the ones pushing crazy laws and, and, and it's the, the Democrat voters and the leftist activists who are marching around these cities and demanding illiberalism, we got a broken system that's falling apart. So what do we do? I don't know, because unfortunately, individualists ain't that good at organizing, are we? So speak up, stand up for what you believe in, find a community and build culture. It's the best I can, the best I can do. Going back and, uh, to this juror, I, I, I hope this video showed you that what she was scared of, it didn't matter. You're scared of the riots? I hope you're ready for more and it'll be your fault. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 8 p.m. at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out. And we'll see you all then.